Hi everyone, this is our second video in this series on ATP photosynthesis and cellular respiration. The uh, numbers, the, um, the Sunshine State standards are the same, so we're not going to go over those, but we are going to talk about photosynthesis. Now to be clear, uh, photosynthesis, cellular respiration, ATP are all tied together, so you're going to see me talk about ATP and cellular respiration here. Uh, but photosynthesis is a really important biological process. In fact, there wouldn't be any life without it. So let's take a look at photosynthesis. It's pretty straightforward. It's an autotrophic process. That means that plants and plant-like organisms make their energy from the sunlight. Now, I don't like the term make because it's like you actually take the sunlight and convert it into glucose, and that's not what happens. What happens is, is the things that glucose is made of is already there. It's the water and the carbon dioxide. You can see it right here but they take the energy from the sunlight and use it to rearrange these molecules or these atoms into these two molecules actually there's seven there but that's another story it's kinda like Legos uh, if carbon dioxide here is a Lego it's made up of three little pieces of Legos a carbon and two oxygens okay uh, and they're put together to make carbon dioxide but I can break them apart and I can use them to make something else well we've got six of those carbon dioxides and I got six waters which is three more uh, Legos or three more atoms right and um, they're put together to make carbon dioxide and water that's kind of how atoms work you break them apart and put and rearrange them and you can get something entirely different I can take carbon dioxide and water not I can't but plants can and using the energy from sunlight I can take them apart just like Legos and put them back together to create a really amazing molecule called sugar uh, this is actually a very simple molecule called glucose and there's so much uh, oxygen uh, Legos that it's just we got some we got a lot of oxygen left over they just throw it away right uh, they may use it later but most of the time they just throw it away so take a deep breath everybody <sighs> that's where your oxygen comes from is from this process right here okay so this sugar is a very interesting molecule this glucose because the plants use it to do all sorts of things they use it to uh, for energy uh, they store it as carbohydrates in their body humans don't store carbohydrates animals don't store carbohydrates but plants do that's why when you eat sugar cane it's sweet when you eat an apple it's sweet for example okay uh, but they also use this to build longer this is a single monomer and if you remember our discussion on monomers and polymers uh, I can take a monomer and put it together to create a big long polymer so this simple glucose monomer I take it and I put it together uh, in a very long chain I can create something called cellulose and cellulose is a uh, polymer it's a carbohydrate but it's a polymer that uh, plants use to build their structures with specifically their cell walls so most of the when you take out the water most of what's left is cellulose uh, and of course you know I'm looking at my house and it's made out of wood and everywhere I look I see wood and guess what that wood is that's basically the cell walls left over after we killed that tree and cut it all up into boards basically what's left is the cell walls guess what cell walls are made out of cellulose which is made out of glucose so basically my house is made out of sugar um, don't try to lick it though because you yeah different reasons but uh, with some oxygen left over now this is the basic photosynthesis um, chemical reaction uh, carbon dioxide and water gives me sugar and, and oxygen but to be clear for every one sugar that I get I have to have six carbon dioxides and six waters and I create one sugar and I release six oxygen molecules which is actually two oxygen atoms stuck together for a total of 12 oxygens okay it's a very straightforward very simple process it's done literally tons per second every day on earth I mean it's a constant process is when the Sun comes up this starts and it's actually a two-step process that we'll talk about in just a second but um, we need to remember that the, the point here is that the energy from sunlight is kind of being trapped in this sugar molecule and now the sugar molecule has energy and every bit of energy that you've ever used in your entire life and every living thing on earth yes there are very few small exceptions we don't even worry about those but every single bit of energy you've ever used in your life came from the sunlight trapped in this molecule or some version of it I didn't tell you this plants also will take the energy in this and rearrange it to make fats, lipids, oils, and waxes. So corn oil is full of energy, for example. Olive oil is full of energy. And um, that energy ultimately came from this sugar molecule, which ultimately came from the sun. So yeah, we can trace everything back to the sun. All right. So uh, this is what I just told you. Let me repeat it again. Photosynthesis makes organic molecules um, out of, you know, they make glucose. 
out of inorganic materials called carbon dioxide and water. You know, and I just showed you that, all right? It be, it's the beginning of all food chains and food webs. Now, you've studied food chains and food webs before. We're going to study them in a later video, but all food chains or food webs start with this process. Yes, there is an exception or two, but they are very rare, and they're just not something we really talk about. I mean, we can, but we won't today. All right. Uh, oxygen makes oxygen gas. It can be used in cellular respiration by all living things every living thing and in this case uh, there are some exceptions too um, there are some things in which oxygen is poisonous but um, almost all living things except for some very simple bacteria use oxygen for cellular respiration which is the next video and finally something very interesting you'll remember they they use carbon dioxide well that carbon right there that's the carbon you hear about all the time on um, when people talk about climate change, there's too much carbon in the atmosphere. We've got to reduce our carbon emissions, that sort of thing. Well, this carbon that's in the atmosphere is what they pull out. They pull it out right there in the form of carbon dioxide. Trees, plants, all photosynthetic organisms will pull that carbon out and use it to make the sugar. There it is right there. Okay. When that carbon gets stored and you use it for the plant, the plant stores it as carbohydrates. The plant that uses it to build its um, structures with, it uses it for a lot of other things. Plants are made out of quite a bit of carbon, and you know if you think about the weight of an oak tree, which oak trees are huge and heavy, a good portion of that weight is carbon, and when this tree pulls it out of the air, it's reducing the carbon in the air. Now, whether or not you are into climate change or not, uh, whether or not you believe it's real, all the controversy, it doesn't matter, um, there's too much carbon in the air. That, there's no argument about that. You, you know, Unless you're really insane, you don't argue there's too much carbon in the air. What that carbon is causing is an argument that I like to have with people, but um, there's no argument there's too much carbon in the air and we need to pull the carbon out. So guess what plants do? So the more we can plant trees, really, the more we plant trees, uh, the more we're helping with removing that carbon, the less we can destroy trees or other photosynthetic organisms. The more we can encourage photosynthetic growth, the more carbon we can take out of the air. So it's something to think about, keep in mind, because later on we're going to be talking about this whole climate change thing. Photosynthesis, as I said, is the beginning of energy flow through all ecosystems. It starts with the sun. This plant absorbs the sunlight and uses it to build its structures and to make its own food. Um, if that, if the plant had its way, that'd be it. There'd just be plants on Earth, and plants absorb sunlight. When they die, they decompose. Well, you gotta have the decomposers. Forgot about this. <clears throat> when they die, they decompose, and new plants grow in their dead husk of their bodies. And it just is a constant nutrient flow right here. And yes, ecosystems can just be right here sunlight and plants sunlight and plants all day long with the decomposers you know that could be a whole ecosystem but along came animals and animals eat plants and it's just that simple right other things eat plants but mostly animals eat plants so the energy that this zebra gets comes directly from this grass the energy this grass gets comes directly from the sun and then you know the zebra's all fat and happy well i don't care if i eat the grass but hey you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm important and then all of a sudden a lion comes along and eats the zebra and then you know the energy f goes from the zebra to the lion and now the zebra was fairly irrelevant now the lion is is getting all the energy and the decomposers right by the way most of it goes to the decomposers but all the energy this lion ever 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 uses got to it through this process ultimately from the sun through some type of producer then through some type of first level consumer and then to the lion um, you've seen food chains and food webs okay by the way everything decomposes there should be a line going from the deer to the decomposers and from the plants to the decomposers because that's what soil is is decomposing plant and animal matter and um, plants will grow into this decomposing well, and mushrooms and other things but it all creates a soil plants will grow into the soil and it creates a cycle now keep in mind this is nutrients this is matter this is not energy energy flows in and flows out okay but the nutrients keep getting recycled the energy is not recycled and that's the best way to put it food webs are the same way the energy you can tell how the energy flows through these things okay just by drawing arrows um, <clears throat> So once again, here we are back to photosynthesis. Photo means light. Synthesis means to put together. This literally means we're just putting a structure together using the energy from light. Plants use sunlight to turn water and carbon dioxide into glucose. Glucose is a kind of sugar. Plants use glucose as food for energy and as a building block for growing. Autotrophs make glucose and heterotrophs are consumers of it. Just a quick review of what we just talked about. Now, here's an interesting thing because it's helped us. This was an experiment done in the 1648, almost 500 years ago, by this guy named John Baptista van Helmont who had a really cool name back then, but today he'd get made fun of. But 
he wanted he wanted to know something you know and a lot of us have this misconception I want to clear this up that's why I made this slide he took a willow tree that weighed about five pounds and he planted it into 200 pounds of soil and he let it grow and he let it, he kept watering it but he let it grow and he let it grow for four years and in four years the willow tree grew to be 200 pounds uh, I'm sorry, the, the willow tree grew to be 169 pounds. It was 5 pounds. It put on 164 pounds of weight. But he pulled it out of the soil, weighed it, okay, and threw it away. But then he weighed the soil. Now, if all that mass came from the soil, that soil should be 164 pounds less. But it didn't. The soil weighed almost exactly the same, just a little bit less. Because some of what that tree became did come out of the soil, but it was mostly water that rained down on it and the rest of it came out of the air, meaning that it pulled the carbon out of the air. The bulk of what you see when you look at a tree is carbon that is pulled out of the air. This helps to really prove that the this idea of photosynthesis is, um, is this is how it works. The trees pull the carbon out of the air, the water gets rained on them on a daily basis, they get the sunlight from the sun, so from the soil, they don't get much in terms of what goes into their body. Now, the soil supports them, and there are nutrients in the soil, but it's a very small amount to all total. But there are nutrients in the soil at the end, which is why the soil weighed almost the same as it did four, four years earlier, because the tree did remove some things from the soil. There are things in the soil that do go in the tree, but not much. Most of the tree is water from the air uh, and carbon from the air. So interesting little experiment there. Um, just a quick look at uh, like a leaf plant leaves have many cells this right here everywhere you see this little you know here's a big huge pancake like cell called a cuticle uh, here is the uh, palisade cell these little green dots on the inside those are called the chloroplast that's where the photosynthesis happens we'll take a close look at that in just a second underneath the palisade cells are the spongy cells they they have a function notice they have chloroplasts um, and then underneath it is another layer of epidermis and cuticle cells there are some cells in the bottom called the stoma and they're made out of guard cells. Uh, guard cells help open and close and allow it, yeah, okay, but the thing is, is that, you know, a leaf is made out of many different kinds of cells, but look how much photosynthesis is going on. Lots of those things have these little green dots called chloroplasts, and that's where all the photosynthesis is occurring. F leaves are designed for photosynthesis. It's just all there is to it. So leaves are green because they contain the pigment called chlorophyll. That's what the molecular structure of chlorophyll there here is. Chlorophyll is a pigment. It absorbs sunlight and turns it, uses that energy to do something mechanical. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But leaves, if they can, they have as large a surface area as they can to absorb, absorb as much sunlight as possible. What do you mean, if they can? Well, in the tropics where it never freezes, you can have very broad leaves. But up in further north you get where it freezes, your leaves can't be quite so big because big broad leaves freeze and kill the plant and you know you get all the way up north in Canada and stuff where the leaves up there are needles because they that's as big as they can grow and still survive freezing but the further south you go the leaves should get roughly bigger and um, that's because they don't freeze and they can absorb more sunlight all right let's talk about a pigment real fast first of all anytime you see the term pigment I think I want you to think of it as dealing with colors pigments take light Okay, and do something with it. All right, either they reflect it or they absorb it. That's the first thing they do. If they absorb the light, that's energy. And energy can't be destroyed or created; it can only be changed. So pigments change light energy. If they absorb it, they can change light energy into something else. Sometimes it's heat. Uh, you know, go outside on a very hot, sunny day wearing a white T-shirt, and then go outside a little later wearing a black T-shirt, and you'll notice a difference almost immediately. The black is a very light absorbing pigment and it will absorb the sunlight and turn it into heat and it will heat up the shirt. Um, so a lot of times pigments will absorb light and turn it into heat. That happens, that's what most pigments do. Some pigments do crazy things like absorb light and turn it into electricity. Some people, some pigments absorb light and hold it and then later on release it kind of makes it kind of a glow in the dark thing. The pigments in leaves absorb light and use it to do mechanical work which is what I told you about rearranging those Legos and we're about to take a close look at that but these pigments absorb and reflect certain wavelengths of light if you remember all light is made out of a combination of all the wavelengths if it's white light as is from the Sun it's every color under the rainbow but chlorophyll 
is a pigment that only absorbs a certain amount of sunlight. Um, it absorbs a, a pretty good range of sunlight, but it doesn't get it all. And so over the millennia, uh, plants have, have evolved the ability to create different types of chlorophyll that absorb more light. So the more light you absorb, to plants, light means food. So the more light you absorb, the more food you get. So they use at least three types of chlorophylls um, to get as much light as they can. So take a look at this graph. Here, this dark green line represents the sunlight that chlorophyll A can absorb. And as you can see, it gets all the blues. Uh, well, it gets a lot of the blues. When it gets towards the greens and the yellows, it doesn't absorb it. But then it comes over here and gets some of the oranges and the reds. Chlorophyll is pretty good. But if that was the only line here, it's missing a lot of light. So, you know, chlorophyll B, which is an accessory pigment, gets the light blues. Actually, kind of almost getting into the greens. And it gets, look at all the light that it gets that chlorophyll misses. That's really good for the plant, right? The plant now gets even more sunlight. And then you got the carotenoids, and don't forget it comes over here and gets a little bit more too, the chlorophyll B. Then you got the carotenoids that pick up all these colors, and it gets, you know, right here it gets even more of the green towards the yellow. And as a result, because of these three, it get light from here to here gets absorbed, and from here to here gets absorbed. That's a pretty good slice of the spectrum. But what happens to the light that, light that doesn't get absorbed? It gets reflected. And that's why plants, because this is the bulk of the light right here, guess what color plants are? They look green. And then when the green, when in the summertime, when the chlorophyll A and the chlorophyll B starts to die off, you start to see some of the reds too, right? Which are not in the summertime, in the wintertime. When, the, when these chlorophyll A and chlorophyll Bs kind of get destroyed over the course of the summer, uh, they don't absorb the reds and the yellows anymore. And guess what? The leaves turn red and yellow. So that's how pigments work. Um, and I've already told you that. Now photosynthesis use these pigments in the light dependent reactions to absorb the sunlight and to start putting together these molecules. Now this is a very complex process and I'm going to try to explain it as, as clearly as I can and as easily as I can, but it is complex, but it does involve two steps, the light dependent and the light independent reactions. The light dependent reactions require light, that's why they're light dependent. The light independent reactions don't, okay? In the light dependent reactions, light is used to take certain parts I think it's water and um, yeah it's just water and they split it apart and they use the energy that they split it apart with and they use it to charge up ATP from ADP if you remember the last video uh, that's one way that we can make the ATP there's another one in here too it's uh, it's called NADH I think there's another one called FAD these all get charged up in the light dependent reactions and then they're sent to the light independent reactions where all that energy is used to then make the sugars. We're going to take a close look at that. Here's the light dependent reactions. It's, um, it's a process called the electron transport chain. Now pay very close attention to this because when we get to respiration in the next video it's going to look a lot like this and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you it's very close to being the reverse. It's not exactly reverse but it's very close. We start out with an electron transport chain then we go to a cycle in photosynthesis. Respiration starts out as a cycle and goes to then to an electron transport chain and it's it's really close to being the exact opposite but it's not the exactly. Okay, but the light dependent reactions in photosynthesis are the electron transport chain. They're in a membrane. I don't know if you can see this or you know it should look familiar to you if you've been following. This is a membrane. This is not the cell membrane but this is the membrane of a thylakoid which is something found inside of the chloroplast. And yes, it's a very similar structure because they have a similar origin, but that's another day. Embedded in the cell membrane are these pigments, and these pigments then perform a function. Okay, So what we have here is I want you to notice something. Water is going in. All right, Water goes into this reaction, and it's split apart. And almost immediately, the oxygens from the water are thrown away. We're done with them. Okay, The hydrogens get charged up and they're used to do things like turn this ADP into ATP and then they move on down this electron transport chain through these pigments which every time that moves to a pigment and sunlight hits it, the, the pigment moves it along even further okay and more hydrogen is used more water is used but the main important thing is things like this FADH is turned into FADH2 and the NAD is turned into NADH so when we're all done by the light moving through these um, pigments and these pigments grabbing the water and charging it up and getting energized then that energy is used to charge ADP to ATP 
FAD to FADH2 and NAD to NADH and these are now charged up molecules that's the goal of photosynthesis okay uh, and then these charged up molecules then go to the second round of reactions okay but what's crucial that you understand is this is where the light used the light hits these things and does this movement around this mechanical energy um, the light independent reactions, this is called the, also called the Calvin cycle. It is a cycle. Now I want you to remember that we produced ATP and NADPH and we produced that other thing but it doesn't necessarily mention it. Those things go in here, okay? But also going in here is carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide goes in, ATP goes in, NADPH goes in, and out comes the discharged NADP plus it's now needing to go back to the light reactions and get charged out comes the discharged ADP that needs to go back to the light reactions and get recharged but also out comes this six mark carbon molecule called a sugar now one thing about this cycle is that it happens to happen six times uh, because sugar has six carbons every time the cycle turns it puts a carbon together with another carbon but it has to do it six times in order for it to create the six carbon sugar so this is why it's called a cycle. It happens six times. As the result, we get carbon going in here, water goes in here, carbon goes in here. Oxygen comes out of here, glucose comes out of here. Okay? So that's how we get our, our um, you know, carbon and water goes in, oxygen and glucose comes out. But this is how glucose is made. It's a process called photosynthesis. It is a very complex. You'll notice I haven't discussed anything like Rubisco or G3P or RUBP. They're intermediate forms, and they're just not something we need to talk about. Okay, it gets very complex. All right, but remember that what is made in the light dependent, okay, comes over here to the light independent and is used to take the carbon dioxide and turn it into sugar. Now, to be clear, I want you to think about something. Light independent reactions do not require light. Now, let's think about this. These must have light, meaning that these things can only happen, this reaction can only happen in the daytime, right? So when does this reaction happen? It does not require light. When does this happen? Don't say at night, because yes, it happens at night, but it also happens in the daytime too. This just means it doesn't need light. Just because it doesn't need light doesn't mean it can't happen in the light. Okay, it's not a vampire. So this happens all the time. This only happens in the daytime, but this happens all the time, okay? Which means this happens a lot faster than this does, but this gets caught up at night, so that when this starts back up again the next day, this is ready to go, okay? But there's something I need you to know about the two reactions. Um, so let's talk about some things that affect photosynthesis. Uh, the first one is um, light. As the light intensity goes up, okay, the more light you give it, the more photosynthesis there is, but notice there's an upper level. There's, it gets to the point where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm using all the light. I can't take any more. Don't give me any more light because it won't do any good. So the closer you get to having this maximum amount of light, the, the photosynthesis doesn't speed up anymore. And at some point, you can give it more light, but it won't do any good. This is why you can kind of engineer yourself a hothouse for growing tomatoes or something running off of grow lights, and you only need a certain amount. You don't need all of it, and then the more you add. Now, if you're here and you turn up the lights into here, uh, you know you're going to get more photosynthesis. But from here to here is not much more. From here to here, hardly anything at all. So, the amount of light is important. The more light, the better. But there's kind of an upper limit. The same thing with carbon dioxide. Now, the more carbon dioxide there is, the more photosynthesis there is. That makes sense because it pulls in carbon dioxide. But you can reach this upper level. It can only use so much, and after a while, you can keep adding more, but it won't do any good. So that's kind of where we are right now. We're here. We've got as much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as plants can use, and yet we're still putting more and more in there every day. And so the plants are growing as fast as they'll ever grow, and we do. We have record crops. But um, we keep adding more, and, and the plants can't keep up. But here's something that's interesting. Temperature. Notice how when temperature goes up, photosynthesis increases until it gets to a certain point. This is right at around 105 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 110 degrees Fahrenheit just about your hottest day in Florida ever okay this is where it reaches its maximum and actually starts to go downhill anything past that and it doesn't do it any good in fact it's damaging to it so um, we have a range of temperatures because down here it totally stops so we have a range of temperatures in which photosynthesis can occur and if it goes below it or above it then um, it doesn't work anymore and so there's no point in doing it now 
this particular one is caused by enzymes. Enzymes are the proteins that regulate all these chemical reactions. Um, enzymes like to be warm. Enzymes usually work better when they're warm. So that's why down here, when it's cooled off, the enzymes don't work very well, so the process doesn't happen. But something else. Enzymes can get too warm, and they start to not work at a certain temperature. So they have a range of temperatures they like, and that's why um, photosynthesis only occurs within a range of temperatures, because the enzymes only work within a range of temperatures. And so that's it. Uh, here is it all summed up, just a quick review. Um, sunlight hits the thylakoids. This, by the way, this whole structure here is supposed to be the chloroplast. Inside of the chloroplast are these thylakoids. The sunlight hits the membranes of these thylakoids. Water goes in and oxygen comes out. But also what comes out is ATP and NADPH because of that electron transport chain. Okay? This ATP is charged up, this NADPH is charged up, and it goes over here to the Calvin cycle or the light independent reactions. These light independent reactions, they turn and they use this stuff every time they turn. And when they when they use it up, ADP, which is discharged, and NADP+, plus, which is discharged, goes back to the photosystem too, or the electron transport chain to get charged up again. And, then, and you know, there's a cycle of stuff here. But also, every time this thing turns, carbon dioxide goes in, and a little bit of water goes in, but that's not important. Carbon dioxide goes in and glucose comes out, okay? So notice what goes in. Water goes in, carbon dioxide comes in. Oxygen goes out, glucose goes out. Plus there's this, exchange, this cycle going on in here of the ADP and the NADPH. Um, I would almost encourage you to draw this. It's really important. But this production of glucose is probably the single most important thing to happen to all life on Earth. There just simply would be no life without it. And also, when we produce this glucose, we're pulling carbon out of the air and it is drawing down the carbon, and that's important, because otherwise we're going to have some issues. All right, um, that's it. So that ends photosynthesis, and the next video is on cellular respiration, and we're just going to kind of wrap it all up. Thank you.